Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Woodworking Wisdom. Um, my name's Ben. We Today, we are looking at uh, pens. There's some volume on there. So, we've got a pen Q&A. So, really invite you to, to send in your questions today. Um, I've kept it quite simple for what I'm actually turning. We've got a little fountain pen that we're going to work at. Um, so, I've kept the, sim the, the turning quite simple. Um, and hopefully we'll get some of your questions in. We've got loads of different stuff we can talk about uh, whilst we go through the demo as well. Um, so I've already done my preparation today. Um, I've got a couple of blanks here, um, which I've already drilled the holes in, okay, and, and mounted our brass tubes in. So we're one step ahead, okay? I wanted to get that done um, so we're not taking up too much time with the prep. Um, and if you want to see that done, we have got some videos online. Um, go back and check through the other pen turning videos. Uh, we'll show you how we do that prep, um, how we drill these and, and glue those in. Okay, and there's a couple of different methods to do that. Um, but today we're going to get straight into the turning. Um, so I've got a mandrel here. Um, I'm going to be using the compression mandrel. Let me show you that one. Let me just pop that there. So we've got a compression mandrel here. Let's pop the old tool rest to one side. So this is the way we're going to hold the pen onto the lathe. Okay. So if we can just come onto that overhead uh, one there, Jason. Thank you. So today joining us, uh, Jason's on the cameras, and Colin will be asking your questions. So like I say, any questions, just, just pop them in the comments there. So this is a compression mandrel. Okay, goes that way around. Um, we've got this part uh, which acts as the drive. Okay, so that part is going to be in our headstock. Okay, and that turns with the um, with the spindle. Okay, and then this part here, if we can see down there, that's hollow right the way through. Um, and when we mount that in the tailstock, we can bring the two together. And that should just go straight in there, okay? Um, if you did need to realign this, um, you can. Uh, we've got a handle on the on the headstock to the side of the lathe here, um, and that allow you to adjust this um, side to side. Okay, it's quite important that those two marry up, and that that just goes straight into that hollow on the on the tailstock. Okay. Um, so one of the benefits of this type of, uh, of mandrel is that um, it transfers all the pressure. If I get a blank on there, I'll show you what I mean. Um, it transfers the pressure onto the blank. Okay. So actually, let's get the other bushing because they're slightly bigger hole on this pen. So a couple of bushings. And I just want to show you how this mandrel works before we get going. Um, so you would put your your blank in there. The other bushing goes in that side. I probably got a little bit of glue in there, but the uh, tailstock will sort that out in just a moment. So I'm locking off the tailstock, and then as I wind the tailstock in, that's bringing this part forward, and it's clamping on our blank, okay? But from the sides where the bushings are. So as we bring that back and forth, that's what holds the workpiece and, um, and and drives it. Okay, so we've got our first question in. Hi, Ben. So this is from Steve. So the question here is, which is better, mandrel or between centers? Okay, so I've only ever used a mandrel. Um, I've not turned between centers for, for a pen. Um, I really like these mandrels. Um, you've got that really kind of safe way of uh, work holding with this bar going through, actually physically through the workpiece. Um, there's no way that can ever leave the lathe. Um, you know, you might get bits chipping off, um, but actually it is held on that. There's no way it's going to, you know, escape off of the lathe. I've always preferred using a mandrel. And, and well, I say that I've not turned them between centers. Um, I've used a few various different mandrels, um, this one being my favorite. Um, but there's a couple others we do. There's one um, that has this kind of collet system. So let me just show you this one. So this one has a collet on it, um, which allows you to 
bring that bar in and out okay because we always want the shortest distance between centers when we're turning okay that will cut down the vibration and this one with the collet allows you to do that but it does rely on a center in the tail stock so something like this um, coming up and resting on that part of the mandrel okay which isn't you know it's not particularly a bad thing what it can do if you put too much pressure on through um, advancing the tailstock along um, it can flex the bar okay especially on the longer pens if you're putting too much pressure on this way okay and then the other thing it can do sometimes is just affect the uh, the tip of your um, of your live center okay so it can kind of bite into that which isn't a problem if you're always doing pens, um, but if you want to move from project to project, you know, we want to keep these as, as, um, as good as possible, really. Okay, so another question. Yeah, Sean was just asking, what glue do you recommend? Okay, yeah, so I use the, um, the Z-Poxy. Um, so this is the uh, Zap Z-Poxy. Okay, this is the five minute version because I'm only doing one pen today. Um, I use the five minute. Um, if you were to do a series of pens, um, I would go with the 30 minute. You got that longer open time, and um, you know it'll allow you to do them all. And I generally, if I'm if I'm doing pens, if I'm doing the prep, I'll I'll tend to do sort of five to ten at a time um, because that way we're all set up with our um, you know with our drilling and, and things like that. Okay, um, Zeb Poxy, really good. Um, it says on here, excellent gap filling and shock resistant. Okay, what I find sometimes with the um, with the CA glues, the super glues, um, is that they they can become quite brittle. Uh, they dry really hard. You get a really good bond with them. Um, but actually, when we're turning, we introduce a lot of vibration into that, and that can sometimes kind of shatter that glue, um, and you'll lose, you know the barrel will escape or something like that um so always i go with this um said poxy and it's just become one of those products um that you trust and you kind of you know it, it's it's that good um that I, I wouldn't really use anything else anymore okay so another question um when you get to it uh, cliff was just wondering what bush size you were going to use on this pen okay um so they are it, they're four bushings of this pen um, I'm not sure of the actual size, um, but each um, pen comes with its own set of bushings. I can give you the part number. Um, so these are 310387, um, and these are the bushings that are specific to the, the fountain pen that I'm going to turn. Okay, all in the links um, down below um, at the, uh, by the comments there. Okay, so another question. So this is from Maria. Um, when so with her compression mandrel when removing it the push out bar always gets stuck in the in the tail end of the mandrel is there a way of stopping this from happening the push out bar so we've got a hollow mandrel um what do we reckon so that it sounds like the push out bar if we were to push that in there that's getting stuck in that end i'm guessing um might be one of the reduced diameter push-out bars, maybe. Yeah, of course. Some of these have a little step on them, on the on the push-out bars. Um, I don't know, really. Could you think of a way, guys, that would um, that would help push that through? Maybe we don't really want to seal that up because that's it goes right the way through there. What about using the tail stock to retrieve? Yeah, absolutely. Good shout, Colin. So all of these are on a Morse taper. So what you could do, Maria, is just to um, to say we've got it on here. Instead of bringing it back and then using the knockout bar, okay, we can use the auto eject. So let's go overhead on this one. If we can just go to that overhead camera there, thank you. Um, if we pull this one back, okay, you can see it going back into there. And I've just come to a bit of a stop. Um, because this is on a taper here, if we keep on bringing that back, that's going to auto eject our um, our live center. Okay, the hollow one. So you could you could always do that. Thanks, Colin, for that. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, I would use the auto eject um, on on the lathe on the tailstock. Okay, so more questions. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, Good first, stuff. Firstly, from Woodwork Learner, um, he's saying he has to ask, but are you going to use the Cohen way skew on them? <laughs> I might do. I've never used the Cohen way skew. I think today's my day. Um, to, to give it a little practice, I think so. And Jason's, let's not forget Jason's. <laughs> okay, then, guys. So, um, oh, another question. Let's let's keep going with the questions. Another two. Another two, um, lovely. Is there a replacement tip for the Axminster Revolution Live Centre? And if so, what part number? If A replacement tip for this one? No, the, uh, the Axminster Live, the Evolution, the big one. This is the not the one you're using the big evolution uh, live center. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we're talking about we got one here. I you can get replacement tips for those. Um, you can get there's there's like a conical one um, and things like that, isn't there? Yeah. You can absolutely. Um, haven't got that information to hand, but perhaps if Lily could have a look at that and and pop that in the comments for you. Okay. So another question here. Um, from David, which method is better, drill the blanks on a pillar drill or drill on the lathe using a pen jaw? I prefer using it on the pillar drill, okay? Um, because like I said before, um, I usually do these in, in batches. Um, so I prefer the pillar drill because of that quick kind of change. So you can put one in, drill your hole, take it out, next one goes in. And with those, um, with the, the kind of centering vices so this is the vice i use on the on the um pillar drill okay you can actually clamp this down and um it will go back to center each time so let's go on that overhead camera camera three lovely thank you um so this is a centering vice um i use this in the pillar drill okay if i've just got one to do i'll, I'll usually do it on the lathe because i'm kind of working around the lathe anyway and there's not that kind of set up and break down you have to keep on doing. Okay. Um, so my preferred method would be, uh, would be the pillar drill. All right. Um, so um, we all right for a minute then, Colwyn? Good stuff. Thanks for your questions. Let's just get me, um, get me going. So there's the, um, the pen mounted on the mandrel. Okay, so we've got um, our, there's four blanks to this pen. Sorry, four bushings to this pen. We're going to put the bushing on. And you'll see that this hole here is bigger than our 7 mil bar on our, our mandrel. That's where these come into, um, you know, come into use. They space this blank off of the bar using the thickness of the, um, of the, uh, bushing okay so one bushing goes on i've got a little pencil mark across my blanks um so we can get the the grain running through it all right good stuff so we're going on here so that's the first uh blank there these bushings kind of sit back to back sometimes you'll see them they'll be sort of joined in the middle and have two shoulders either side. All of these bushing sets are very slightly different to one another, um, but the process is very much the same. And these bushings relate to the size of the components on the pen, okay? So when we turn these blanks down, we're gonna turn them down to these diameters. Um, and then when we put the pen together, those diameters are gonna be the same as say the end cap, um, the clip and things like that. Okay, so that's what um, those bushings are giving us a reference to. And this is a straight pen. So all these bushings are the same, um, same diameter. Okay. This was a piece of uh, Mapani, I think the guys said. It was, um, it's an exotic, it really hard. It was really hard when I, um, when I drilled it. Um, but it should give us, it should polish up really nicely. So using a short tool rest allows me get to get nice and close to the pen there, or the blank, I should say. And I'm just going to turn that over by hand, make sure 
um, we got that clearance on the tool rest. Um, to find our, um, you know, how how much we want to wind this on, we need to just give that a twist. And if it's the spindles moving with the pen blank, you should be okay. And we can always tighten that up a little bit as we get going. If we find that blank stops um, before we get turning. So goggles on. Okay. Just going to pop them on, protect our eyes. And we are going to use a roughing gouge. Okay. So nice wide steel on that one. Um, and I'm going to use it fairly gently. I'm not going to be taking a massive cuts with this. I'm going to knock off the shoulders and perhaps show you a couple of different um, gouges or chisels that you can rough down with. So lay speed down to zero. Okay. Pressing the green button. And then I'm just going to bring the lay speed up. I usually turn these around about the 2000 RPM or a bit, a bit over. And I'm going to rest my roughing gouge on the tool rest. Okay, it's not touching. And then as I bring the handle up and just bring the gouge forward a little, we can start to knock off those edges, those corners. And I'm just going back and forth. So it's really important that both hands are moving at the same time. Okay. If I exaggerate, if I was to hold one hand still, let me turn that lathe off. If I was to hold one hand still and just use that one, you can see it goes in an arc. Okay. So it's important that both hands travel at the same time or that you plant your feet and kind of lean into it. That keeps everything nice and straight. And again, I'm just taking little cuts, just knocking off those corners. Holding it, my hands fully on that steel and the handles down by my hip here. And I'm just using my thumb on top as almost a little chip deflector. So those shavings aren't coming up near my face. It's well clear of the project. I'm not going to catch it. So that should be pretty much rough down. If you wanted to practice things like your planing cuts, um, now's the time to do it. We've still got plenty of... Um, material on here we can have a, a good practice with and we're not going to you know come down to our brass tube so if you need to um, to practice things like planing cuts you know take this opportunity to do it um, you've got a nice kind of straight um, cut to make um, so these are uh, you know perfect times to, for, for practicing with these tools I'm going to have my first ever go with a Colwyn Way skew and see what we think about this so I'm going to bring the, um, uh, you know, this isn't really ready for a planing cut. I'm, I'm kind of um, just, like I said, using it for a bit of practice, really. I must say, I'm not a master of the skew. Oh, it's lovely. Works like a dream, nice and sharp too. So that's our kind of planing cut. What I'm doing here is I put the um, the skew down onto the the rest there. The rest has come just slightly above center now, and then I've just bring it over to that kind of 45 degree, and then just laying the bevel on there, and just taking a really nice fine cut.
You can see, I don't know if it's picking it up on camera, not really, but that's almost kind of burnished it. It's got a really lovely, smooth finish compared to this one off the roughing gouge. It's a shame you can't see that as well, but that's a lovely finish we've achieved with that. Um, we're, st we're still in the roughing down process though, so let me just show you a different tool. I know the guys like to rough down with a, with a bowl gouge. So let's show you how we're going to do that. So the flute's coming right over. I'm going to drop that tool rest back down. And I'm going to come in a touch as well. Let's turn the lathe off, make sure we're extra safe. And just creep that forward. Good. So bowl gouge, I'm bringing the bevel right over and almost using it like a skew. Oh, sorry, bringing the flute right over, and that can give you a really nice clean cut. I think I need a bit more practice with that one, so I'm gonna go back to my my roughing gouge. Okay, so another question. Uh, yeah, David's asking why the full size chisel and not the Axminster or the Crown Cryer or the Procraft small versions. Um, so, with all of these things, you can get little project um, uh, chisels and gouges. Okay, I prefer the ones with the long handles because they can translate across different, um, you know, across different work pieces. Um, you know, those one, those those smaller ones are really good if you're concentrating on pens or if you're doing other small projects, perhaps, um, you know, like some doll's house uh, furniture, things like that, or the little lace bobbins. They're really good. They're really light. If you're spending a lot of time at the lathe, you're doing a lot of turning. Um, they're a little bit lighter, shorter handles, and perhaps you've got a little bit more control. But, you know, these, um, these, these bigger tools are doing exactly the same job. They've got the same cutting angles on them. Um, and we're using these across lots of different projects. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, just picking these up off the shelf, um, you know, they're doing much the same job. Um, and again, I've not really, I've, I've used a couple of the miniature tools um, where the, you keep the, the tools in the handles and things like that. Um, I just prefer the, the bigger tools. Um, and you don't get as much vibrations through things like the skew particularly. Um, having that bigger steel on it just feels a bit more, um, you know, a bit more robust and a bit more comfortable to hold. And I feel it takes away out, it takes away some of the vibration and things as well. So when we're looking for those really lovely finishes, um, I like to come onto these these bigger tools. And also, you got a bigger bevel on these to to kind of rest on and and get those cuts right. So back to roughing. Still up a bit high, so let's just bring that down a smidge. And that's allowing me to be able to drop the handle back down. And I'm just going back and forth, and I'm using the tool rest to keep everything nice and straight and parallel. And I'm bringing this right down to the diameter of our bushings then. What we're going to do is we're going to turn this pen and we'll finish it. Um, and then we're going to look at um, assembly and perhaps a little bit of disassembly as well. So I don't know if there's any pen makers out there and you've, you know, you've done all the hard work. You've, you've done your turning and polished them so they're looking lovely. Um, and then it goes to to putting them together and you put the, you know, you put your um, thing in the wrong, put the nib in the wrong end or, or put the lid wrong. So 
So what I'm trying to do is just bring this so it's just above our uh, bushings. Not much to go. And it's like I say, this is a very straight pen. Um, you can put a bit of shape on these. Um, I prefer them nice and straight and parallel. Um, and always, if you're putting a shape on it, consider where that clip's going to be. We don't want to um, have a, a kind of contour so the clip doesn't engage on your pocket. And likewise, you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want it to kind of crown because um, that will throw the clip, clip off at an angle. So usually if you've got a clip, I tend to keep that piece straight. And if you want to put a shape on it, you do it down the kind of business end of the pen, the writing end of the pen. Okay. Take a little bit more. This is a really hard timber, this, and, and quite oily as well. Okay. So we're just above our bushings. Okay. Um, I tend to leave a, a little bit of room so we can carry on with that planing cut, get it right the way down, um, and you'll get a better, you'll achieve a better finish that way as well. Um, so we're going to skew this along. We may do a little bit of scraping either end. Um, we're, we're, but we'll use the skew again. So bringing the tool rest up. Let's go with this middle sized uh, skew here. And the planing cut. So I'm resting the bevel and then bringing it along. Keeping that heel out of the way so we're not kind of scratching or anything like that. And that is just peeling off, it's lovely. Coming back the other way. Because I don't want to come in on this end and potentially lift the fibers or the, the grain out. So I'm coming off onto our, um, onto our bushing. I'm just picking up on a couple of little lines there I want to remove. Good. And then this way. And then back the other way, keeping that point and the heel well out of the way of the project. We don't want that catching. And I'm just feeling um, where the bushes um, come up to our piece of timber. We want just another little bit off of here. And coming back the other way. So I'm picking up where that last cut stops. And right onto our bushing there. Lovely. Little smidge on the end there. And I'm just going to bring this in as a scraper and just gently touch that there and there to make sure we're lovely and smooth and at the exact same diameter as our bushing. And that's really important because like we said before, those bushings are the same diameter as the um, as the pen components. And if there's a step here or a hollow here, when you start to put the pen together, again, that's going to translate onto your finished project. Okay, so we've got another question. A couple of things. Um, which is the fountain uh, pen kit? Which which number is it? Um, so we've got the kit here. Again, that's on the links underneath, but we are um, the, the pen kit that we're turning is uh, 310 479. 
Okay. And again, the bushes that go with that are 310387. Okay. Uh, just any chance we can get the camera just a little bit closer on the zoom whilst you're doing the pen? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we zoomed out a bit there. Sorry about that, folks. You can see my skew work and all its <laughs> horrible glory. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm going to get seasick in a moment. That's lovely. Okay. So, ready for sanding that. It's quite a dusty timber, this. Even though it's oily, it's kind of very, very dry. I know this has been in our pen box for at least six years. It's, a, it's an old piece um, of, um, of a exotic that we've had kicking around. And it's time to use all these bits up. We'll get back to our natives. Um, so, we need to sand this. So I'm going to pop the extraction on. Um, goggles got to stay on as well. So let's pop the extraction on here. And I'm not going too, um, too coarse with the abrasives. I'm going to start off at 400. And if that's not doing what I want it to do, I might drop back um, to, to 240 or something. But straight in with this one. I'm going to bring that extraction in nice and close. There we go. We don't want to be breathing any of this horrible stuff in. And I'm going to keep this moving, this abrasive. There's not much material left in the way of uh, timber there now. Um, and we don't want to overheat this and crack it. So we'll swap from blank to blank as we start to introduce heat in. I'm not folding the, the abrasive. I'm keeping it as one piece so I can feel the heat as soon as it starts to build up. So like I say, keep that moving, swap from blank to blank, and I'm not coming onto those bushings and bringing that metal particle back into our timber. Although this is very dense and, and um, you know, close grained. Um, it's it's not a good habit. We want to you know stick to good practices. Of course, if this was an acrylic or a polyester, that's not going to apply. It, it's um, that's non-porous, so you can sand onto the bushings if you like. And I'm just going to have a peek at that. It seems to have a couple of white lines on it still. Um, so we may drop back to that 240. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of kind of chattering that's gone on there. So I'm dropping back to that 240 grit. And also drop the speed down. I should have dropped that down before. We're dropping that down to around about 800. Uh, for the sanding, with again, that's going to help with the heat. And what I'm looking at is any little tears or um, bits like that are kind of appearing to me as little white lines. So we're just wanting to eliminate those um, before we move up through the grades on our abrasives. And just dropping the speed down on the lathe, I can really feel the difference um, on the heat that's coming through uh, the abrasive. That's lessened a lot. Now you can see how this stuff is kind of clogging the paper a little bit. Let's give that a little tap. And we're just taking our time to get this surface nicely dressed. It 
some timbers will be a lot more forgiving than this. Um, this one seems to show any little imperfections. Uh, but it's a, it's a lovely looking uh, wood. Nice colour once we get our polish on it. Let's have a little look at that. Uh, it's not far off. We've just got a couple of little white spots there I want to get rid of. And then we'll go back up through the grades. And we'll, we'll polish this. Just check again. There's no no point in sanding more than we have to. I'm going to sand it along the grain just by hand. Turn that over and see if we can't get rid of that little little nick there. Again, we're going with the grain. Good. Now we can go up to our 400. Let's just get rid of some of that dust that's trapped on the abrasive. And people make these pens out of all sorts of different blanks. Uh, like I say, this is just a bit of um, a bit of an exotic timber. But you know, you could use acrylics, polyesters. Um, you could make your own resin blanks. There's all sorts of um, blanks you can get. You know, pre-made or make them yourselves. Um, we see a lot of pens in the kind of natural materials like antler. Um, you know. Um, kind of horns and things like that. There's some really cool blanks out on the market. Okay, then up to 600. And this is the Hermes cloth back abrasive. Again, this isn't going to kind of give us a sharp edge if we fold it. It's got that nice kind of soft, it's really nice and pliable. And I can feel the project through, through the paper or cloth in this case. Okay. Let's have a little look, make sure we got rid of the worst of our scratches and give it a little brush off as well. Sometimes the dust looks like scratches, but I think we've got the worst of it there. Let's pop that extractor off. Okay, so we've got a question. Do the bushings wear out? And if so, how many pens before needing to replace them? <laughs> okay. So that's, um, you know, th the bushings do wear. Um, we, um, if you put a tool up against them, they'll also cut. We've got, um, we got, you know, these um, high-speed steel um, tools. These are made of a slightly softer steel, and they will, they will cut, um, and they will wear with, with sanding. Um, I tend to not you know try and avoid them if you can um but there's the you know the odd time where you might catch it or um you know perhaps sand a, uh, one of the shoulders off um really you know if you're using your fingers and you've just taken away the the edge of this you can still feel for the diameter okay um but yeah they are all well they're not really a consumable you won't get through um you know you you'll get a a good load of pens out of them before um, having to replace them. 
Um, however many that is, it depends, you know, depends if you're sanding them with a 600 grit or a 150, you know, there's lots of different uh, variables in that. Um, I would just, you know, creep up to them, but not sand on them too heavily. And same with the tooling, um, you know, most of the time the, the blank is going to be beyond the diameter of the bushings anyway. And if you cut beneath the bushings, um, you're kind of getting to the point where the pen's not quite right anyway. Um, but yeah, you replace them once they're, um, once they're completely worn. Um, but the good way to check that if you've got your pen kit is to, um, just, just offer it up to whatever component it, it um, you know, is, is this supposed to be the same diameter too so if you've got you know the one up this end it will correspond to the lid okay and just check them against there make sure that those diameters are still true um, and then they're, they're perfectly usable we've had these for years and years and i you know we, we've sand them every now and then they get caught with a tool um, but there's you know they're still doing their job um, they don't have to be perfect um, but yeah all right, so what we're going to use to polish this, I'm going to use um, some chestnut um, products. We've got um, cut and polish and a micro crystalline wax. Okay, so let's go overhead there, Jason. Um, so if we can come overhead, uh, we've got a cut and polish and the micro crystalline wax there. Um, so that's what we're going to be using. That's a really nice hard wearing surface because, of course, we're going to be handling these quite a lot. OK, so that's my two products I'm going to be using. OK, so we've got a question. Well, two, really. Okay. Um, one from Frogfella. How many times would you use the same piece of abrasive before renewing it? A lot more than what most people give it. Um, yeah, we we're constantly pulling abrasives out of the VIN and um, and reusing them. Um, these cloth back ones, especially, are hard wearing. Um, there's a lot more life in them than you think. And give them a good whack, clear out any of this kind of waste. What you may find if we come overhead again, thank you. Um, some of these timbers are quite oily, so if you've got perhaps like an olive or something like that, that might clog it. Um, so you can roll it get the um you know get the worst of it off give it a whack on the on the lathe um you know these have got a longer life and um you know these days we want to save as much of that manufacturing process as possible and and you know use them and use them until they're um you know until they're not doing their job anymore that's the time to get rid of them and you'll be able to tell when they stop cutting um they'll they'll stop grabbing as much um, and it will kind of be like a smooth surface, a smooth surface on a smooth surface, and you'll feel it and you can just get rid of them then. But yeah, we, we definitely recommend, um, you know, don't use them once or twice and chuck them and, and use more because it's going to cost you more um, and it's not very good for the environment. Okay. So another question. I said this again from Maria, this one. Um, what glue would we recommend to glue the brass tubes into HDPE blank, which is high density plastic like the um stabilized um again i would use the same thing i would use um an epoxy okay as long as that doesn't mess with um the the high density plastics you're using i don't think it would um it's 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 quite a, a kind of a soft glue it's not going to react too much to stuff um but yeah for me the z epoxy all the way i go i use that product a lot it's never failed me over these years. Um, you know, it's got a really good hold, um, and I've I've learned to trust it. Okay, so another question. This is from Martin. Would you use a sanding sealer first? I think over before you use that on the cut and paste. Yeah. Would you? Would you? I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd go straight in with the cut and paste. So I'm using um, uh, the, this cut and paste here. This has got a little abrasive in it. Okay, um, bare wood. Uh, for for use on hard denser woods, this is a very hard um, uh, dense wood. Um, sand back and normal. Yep, you can use. Just read the labels for this. This is going straight on bare wood for me because this is a is a nice um, 
a nice dense piece of timber. Okay, so another question. Maria's just saying that epoxy doesn't work. So the super glue, I guess. Try I think, that. yeah, super glue or the um, the expanding glue, the uh, polyurethane, um, they can work really well. Um, it, polyurethane can be a little bit messy, um, so I would get myself a little board with some nails in it and just um, glue your glue blanks and put them on the nails because um, it expands and it kind of foams out. Um, so I would either use um, the polyurethane or, or super glue. Okay. I've not turned that stuff. The high density is that like um, okay. like a Corian or something? Uh, no, no, more like a plastic type of okay. Oh, cool. I have to check that out. I'm just wondering if not whether the like the welder's plastic pipe fix or oh, yeah. That yeah, plastic pipes in potentially. I don't know whether it'll work with metal though. It's cool. You know, here all the time, every day, I'm learning something new. Even though we've had years and years of doing this stuff, it's really lovely to hear different people's um, ideas, different people's ways of doing things, because there's no kind of, you know, obviously we've got our safety we need to think about, but there's no right or wrong way of doing these. Lots of people have different methods of doing different jobs, and it's great. You know, we, we're constantly learning. Every day is a school day here. So that was a cut and polish. That has a very mild abrasive in it. And it's given me a kind of um, a kind of a satin shine on the pen. I want to bring that up, but also give it a little bit more um, that kind of water repellent and um, a little bit more, um, you know, it's going to last a bit longer. So we won't lose that sheen quite as quickly. Okay, so another question. So this is from Woodsley Summercraft. Um, just purchased the Bill Buffing System. Have you ever used one or do you use one? The build buffing system. Is that um, the buffing wheels? Yeah, so like stitch mops and things like that. Absolutely, you can use those. Um, I use those a lot on little key rings, lots of these little projects. Um, what I would say, if you're going to buff these, don't build the pen first and then buff the whole pen because um, some of them have little... Um, platings and things like that and those buffing wheels can cut through the the gold plating and and stuff like that so just be a little bit wary i would take them off and buff them at this stage okay if you were gonna if you were gonna use a buffing wheel and and keep a tight hold of it as well because uh it could pick it out your hand and and throw it across the room which is you know really disappointing when you've spent all this time um turning so a little bit of microcrystalline on a rag. I'm just going to um, bring that lathe back up to speed. Pop that to one side. Lid back on. We don't want our waxes and stuff drying out. And I can see that little reflective stripe come straight up. It's giving us a nice glossy, glossy finish. And this I am taking straight across the, the bushings. I'm not worried about polishing the bushings. They just look a bit nicer when we get them back in our in their packet. So that was just a um, using the microcrystalline. I'm just using a clean piece of the rag uh, to buff that off. I'm gonna get another bit of blue roll because that one is pretty saturated with all sorts of different things now. So a nice fresh bit of uh, clean rag or or the, the blue roll that we use in here just to get off any of that and that's going to give it a really nice kind of long lasting sheen you could use a friction polish or something like that for for really quick results um but this microcrystalline wax is um it's got that kind of water repellent so you're not gonna um it's not gonna dull as quick as um something like a friction polish would okay so another question so Frogfell is asking, do you have any um, help uh, that you can divulge when it comes to CA glue finishes? Um, and Woodsley Summercrest is adding about thin CA suggests a suggestion. Yeah, so um, CA, we're not going to look at CA finishes today. Um, we're going to have to, I think we'll do another video on a CA finish, um, perhaps like a pre-recorded one. Because um, that gives you a really long lasting finish and super glossy as well. 
can be a little bit messy. Um, so what we're talking about there is um, having a, a CA glue, a, a super glue, the, the very thin ones, and having the lathe just ticking over. Okay, let me just bring my tailstock back in. The way that's applied is you would have the lathe really just kind of ticking over like that. You'd have your thin super glue and you would just be dribbling it along here and then wiping it, almost wiping it off instantly through um, through the rag. And then that builds up in layers. And you can polish that the same way you would a um, an acrylic or a polyester where you get that kind of glassy finish. It'll be, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice finish, really durable, um, a little bit messy. So we're not looking at that today, but a good idea and, and a, great, um, a great finish. We'll look at that another time. Okay, so another question. Um, so this is a suggestion really from Jesse or, or a tip to um, if you're using the bill buffing system to keep the blanks on the mandrel as you're uh, polishing them. Oh, okay. Bring the whole thing up to the buffing wheel. Right. Oh, lovely. So that's a separate thing, is it? That's a uh, like yeah, to polish them, save losing them down the extractor. Keep them on the mandrel to polish. Oh, them. I see. Yeah. yeah. So hold, actually holding the mandrel and then buffing it on the yeah, wheel yeah. there. So I was imagining a, a different kind of polishing kit there. Lovely. Yeah, that's a, a good tip. That. And again, those buffing wheels aren't going to take too much of this metal away. So you're not going to kind of, you know, it's not like a sander or anything. You're not going to take away too much material. So I'm going to lose the mandrel now. I've kept my pen um, in the same orientation. Keep that, um, you know, that grain running right the way through. And we're going to assemble it. Let's pop the mandrel to one side. And I've got myself a little, little table of knocked up. Usually I would take this across to the bench. Let's push the extractor out of the way and get my little table going on here. A little bit of jiggering around to do. So tailstock along, smooth the banjo or the, the tool rest out of the way. Going to put that out there and then bring that banjo in for a little bit more stability. That's nice and solid surface to work on then. Okay, so this is our um, deluxe pen press. Let me just move that. Um, and this is um, uh, assembly and disassembly. So I'm gonna come back a little on the camera here. Okay, so we get a better idea, a bigger view of what's going on. So basically, we have got um, a long lever, and you can see that pushes forward our this little jaw here. On this bit, we've got almost a, a sprung jaw. Okay, so that springs back and forth, and that's really useful. I'm just going to bring it right back out of the way um, so we can get our pen components. So that's how it was mounted on the lathe. And here's my kit. And what I tend to do is just lay out the bits where I think they're going to go. So we've got um, an, a lid. And we've got our um, the actual uh, writing tip. And then that's going to be the end. And then we've got our cartridge, which again, I'm going to pop to one side to keep it um, out the way of confusing us. Okay, so we know they've got the brass tubes in there and let's just have a quick look how much material is left on that. It's a tiny amount, tiny amount of timber. Okay, so just be a bit careful how much we're taking off of these. So we have got here a couple of uh, joiners. Okay, and they're threaded on the inside. And if we look at some of the other components, we know that they're gonna um, go into that. Okay, so this is gonna be our um, the, the back end of the pen. So that's gonna go in there. 
It's a friction fit. So let's bring that up nice and close. You drop that in the slot there. And then we're going to have to come in a little bit closer. And then just using this to push that all the way home. And we're closing the gap there. Okay. I might just come on one more. And make sure that that is bedded in really nice and tight. Good. Um, and then we've got the end here. So we're doing the back end of the pen first. And that's going to again have the other little cuff that we had. Let's pull this one back out of the way. So another question. So this question is from Callum, and this is, I think this is open to everybody to answer. So um, it says, for all you guys, if given a choice, are the robust tool rests really good for sliding chisels along due to hardened steel rod um, against the standard tool rests? Mm -hmm. I'll say yes. You can take that one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yes from Jason, yes from Ben, yes from me. Yeah. So let's have a little look at closer look at that because okay. it is a cool yes thing. James. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at these robust tool rests. So if we can just come overhead, that's lovely. You see this hardened steel bar here. Okay. That's really good. Um, because of that rounded edge on it, the, the, the chisels just, just flow across there. It doesn't dink or dent. Um, it's a really nice little thing. And they come in all sorts of different sizes. We've got a big one down here as well. This is the six inch I was using uh, today. And then we've got uh, the, I guess it's an eight. And then right up to the 12. All right. So it's a big one. Big, uh, all different sizes. Again, um, I don't do a great deal of turning, um, but use that today. It was, it was really nice. So what else have we got to do on our pen? We know that that's going to go in there. Okay. And that's the, the lid. That's our kind of writing implement there. We're going to pop our lid on the other side. Or the clip, I should say. That's going in there. Again, with that sprung jaw there, makes it really easy. We can let go of it even, um, and it's going to hold it there for us. Oh, I forgot to put my little groove in. So I've put the lid in without putting a groove in it. All right, so we're going to have to use the disassembly. We've made a mistake. So let's have a little rearrange on our um, disassembly thing. And this comes with a little rubber tube, which I've cut to size. You get a longer length than this. But what we're going to do is just grab that like that. So I've got my lid and I've put it inside the rubber tube with the clip to one side, okay? So that's coming in here. We bring that jaw right up and just wiggle that in there. And we want that rubber tube to kind of protect our piece of timber. Sometimes, the kind of action of closing down the jaw on it, um, you know, you have to put that much pressure that you're going to mark your piece of acrylic or piece of timber, whatever it is you're using. So that little rubber is just giving us, um, you know, a little bit of, of a softer um, jaw on it. Okay. So we've got this one here. All right, they're all different sizes, these, for all different types of pens. I'm going with that big kind of 10 mil one. All right. And as easy as that, the, um, the lid just pops out. Okay. 
So sometimes with these friction fits, if you put something in, it is a real pain to get them out. This little gizmo, the assembly and disassembly unit will, will, um, will you know, it's a lifesaver really when it comes to, you know, fixing pens. We can make sure we've got it right uh, first time. Have you got a little, a little flat file in there? Just got to put a little nick in, in there. Sorry, I should have uh, grabbed that one. I thought I had one ready. Thanks, Colwyn. So what we're going to do, um, you'll notice on the, um, on the clip here, we've got a little threaded section, okay? And the, um, the part that saves our little kind of quill on the fountain pen um, is this little plastic bit here. That screws onto that, but we'll do that in a moment with just a different tool. But now we've retrieved this, what we need to do is put a groove in our blank to accept this little um, this little clip. And this is the only fountain pen I think we've got um, which you'd have to do this in. The others um, have a kind of, um, the, the clip is built into the, um, the end cap. So I'm just looking on my blank here and I want the clip to sit nicely across the, um, across the grain. So I found a little area where I want my clip to go on. And I'm just putting this flat file between my fingers and taking it back and forth. You don't need a massive groove. I'm trying to keep it nice and straight. You could do this with a little rotary tool. And you can see I'm just starting to produce um, a little kind of groove in the top there. All right. These files seem to be the perfect kind of width to take this. And it's not much you have to go in. And hopefully if I bring that up to camera, you can see that little shiny spot where we've just taken a bit of material away. Okay, that's where our um, clip's going to sit. So let's try that again. So I'm just pushing it in. It's got a little shoulder to locate it. I'm just lining up my, um, my clip with the groove that I've just made. We're getting our, um, our soft jaw back in. Let me get that one, the sprung jaw. And just clamp down on that one. Come back a touch to get that located. That goes in there. And now we can close that up. Just make sure everything's aligned. We can close that up nice and firm this time. Make sure that clip is housed in that little groove that we've made. That's good. Okay, so this is all nice and flush now where the blank meets the component on the pen. So if you were to make a mistake um, in assembly, this little thing is a great tool to, um, to set that right. Okay, one more little tool I'm gonna need um, for my fountain pen is the cap adjuster tool. Okay, let me just have a little tidy up, make sure everything's out of the way from us. And we've got another question here. Yeah, it's just going back to the robust tool rest. That was yeah. All. Um, so it's it a question from Nigel. What's the benefits of the robust tool rest over the access to around stainless tool rests? Um, I'm going to hand that over to one of you guys, if you don't mind. Um, turning's not my, um, you know, my first first love, whatever we're going to call it. It's not one of my, you know, it's not my main thing I do. So I'm going to hand that over to Colwyn, if you don't mind. No worries. So they're very different beasts, really. The robust tool rest is a much larger system. 
um, uh, and a, a welded uh, piece of kit as well. So if you're on a bigger machine, they're going to take a lot more force than the round bar of the Axminster ones. The beauty of the Axminster system is that you've got the flexibility of being able to take different tool rests to one um, uh, to, uh, to one post, for instance, or add in the carving heads, which you can turn into sanding tables. So flexibility, lots of different um, options with the Axminster one, but the rigidity and the smoothness of the robust. Good stuff. So a much more comprehensive answer you got from Cole in there. It's lovely having these guys in the room. Um, but yeah. So what I'm doing here, um, this little bit here is what keeps the um, the um, the tip of the fountain pen uh, nice and safe because that doesn't want to be rattling around or or perhaps fouling on the inside of here. Little cap adjuster tool. Okay, so this has got four little prongs on it which just sit up inside this little plastic insert here. That's going up into the lid and it should kind of find itself on that thread. And I'm just turning that over and then I'm gonna test my pen. I've done a few turns of that. All right, and we can still see that we've got a gap here. We've, we've left the gap. So pen comes back out. Cap adjustment tool goes in. I'm going to give it another couple of turns and just recheck it. A little bit to go. And I would suggest doing it bit by bit. Don't, you know, take it all the way in. And then find you have to back it off. So one more bit, a couple more turns and we should be good. Nice little pen this, lovely little keepsake. Um, and you know, part of the Artisan series, you could perhaps do these as a, as a set. Okay, so that's our um, Artisan fountain pen. We also do a rollable. We also do um, a pencil in that, in that style. Um, so yeah. A, a lovely thing to make a set of and we also got to have a look at how we can assemble and disassemble that pen okay so we've got some more questions I've got a few questions here i'm going to start with callum so uh, robust tool rests have different heights why and then he uh, backs up by saying a standard tool rest is 95 millimeters why would i need a higher one yeah go for it i'm guessing it's to do with the the, the you know the the height of the um headstock here absolutely yeah so different laves different heights of headstock um the standard one seems to work for us um but if you're on a bigger machine with a bigger throw then you need the longer one that's the only reason um and cliff is asking is the cap adjuster part of any kit or is it a standalone um so the actual adjustment tool is its own little thing um, so you buy that one separately if you're um, if you're getting into fountain pens. Um, yeah, that cap adjuster tool. It doesn't come with the kit, unfortunately. It's a it's a standalone purchase. All right. Okay. So Graham's saying, what else can I uh, use to get a good shine on wood instead of CA glue? Because I tend to get more on me than the wood. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of the reason I don't use a CA finish. I um. I'm a little bit scared of super glue, if I'm honest. I've I've glued myself to something before, and um, uh, you know I really like these epoxies. Um, if we're talking about finishes, um, the friction polish is really good. Um, that will give you a really quick, um, a quick shine. But you know, remember these pens are going to be handled a lot. Um, you know, they're going to you got oils and, and and moisture in your skin, um, which will be transferred and perhaps lift that friction polish finish. Um, I really like the um, the waxes, like the microcrystalline, um, give you a really kind of, um, you know, it's not super glossy, but that's kind of what I like. Um, you could perhaps go with the um, Hampshire Sheen, do a high gloss one. Um, that will give you a really nice kind of reflective pen. Um, and you could coat these in resin. You know, you can um, use a resin and, um, and, and buff that up. Okay. Good. One more question here. Mm -hmm. um, is there any difference in fitting the ink reservoir? 
Um, not on this pen. Nope. Um, if you were to, um, some sometimes you can get a, what they call a, an open mandrel, so um, it hasn't got an end on it. Um, and if you were to turn the back end of these pens, um, you know, um, so it was just a piece of timber, and we were to leave this component off, um, that's when you need to consider um, how long this bit's going to be. Um, but straight from the kit, you don't need any, um, you know, any changes for it to take that um, reservoir. It's basically a, um, a longer um, cartridge with um, almost like a syringe head on it so you can pull um, ink up through it um, and, and use it that way. It's refillable, okay? Um, yeah, they're really nice. Um, but no, with these pens, um, there's no, you don't need to make any changes with them. Um, it will all be housed in this, uh, this back end. All right. And I, if I was to give that as a gift, I would put the, um, the cartridge in the end of the pen here without it, without connecting it. So, that, you know, whoever gets to use the pen first, whoever you're gifting it to, um, you know, has the pleasure of, of popping that first cartridge. Okay, so thanks for being with us today. Um, any questions you've got, bring um, send them into our Woodworking Wisdom. If you're enjoying these sessions, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, so I've been Ben. This is Axminster Tools at Woodworking Wisdom. Uh, we'll see you again soon.